So, Sauvignon Blanc. As always, Dan has done all the ampelographical, ampelographical, something yeah. like that. Work. Right. Um, the grape stuff. There we go. That's much <laughs> easier. Um, I will, of course, have maps. Um, I think most people that I can see on the screen have joined us before, which is marvellous. So you all know my slight fetish with maps. Those that haven't, um, expect maps. I like maps. But we will try and explain the differences in styles. It's it's quite a, um, I would describe it as quite a linear grape variety. Not like Chardonnay, which we've got coming up later in the year, which can take lots of different flavours and lots of different textures and lots of different winemaking techniques. Sauvignon Blanc is a bit more linear. So it's it's the I, more- I subtle. thought it was round. Oh, shush. <laughs> Slightly more ovoid, actually, I think you'll find. That's but it. it's as a style, it's a bit more linear. So it's going to be really interesting to really get sort of deep down into the subtle nuances of the styles, why they are like that, the grape, um, the soil types, the climates, the altitudes, that sort of thing. So it should be, it will be less obvious than some of the other tastings we've done, but hopefully it will be just as eye opening and interesting. So we will start with wine number one, which makes sense, is the Foy Sauvignon Blanc. Foy is actually the name of a tree that um, in Chilean folklore, it's it's all about empowering women because the the the, the women are the bearers of the fruit. So that's what the that the whole point of it is. It's it's celebrating the bearing of the fruit and the trees which grow the wine. So there's very much, I think probably all the wines we're talking about today there's very much an emphasis on wine isn't made in a winery wine is made in the vineyard if you get the vineyard right you can pretty much let the wine do what it wants to do in the winery if you've got bad grips you've got to do a lot more work in the winery it's quite transversive actually if one works the other doesn't if that doesn't work you've got to do a lot more to it so um if you all want to, is, sorry, I've always asked a question. I know many of you have joined before, but is there anyone that hasn't done any sort of wine tasting before and just wants me to give a brief intro as to what we're looking for, what we're smelling, what we're tasting, et cetera, et cetera, or is everyone happy that we know what we're doing? Simon! Right. And 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 someone else who's in silly, silly hoot at the moment, as my mum would have called it. Hello, silhouettes. <laughs> it's like Dan was silhouetted until a moment ago. Um, so what we'll do, Simon, if you're happy, we'll we'll taste the first one together and we'll sort of get some smells and flavours and what it is that we're looking for. And then Dan has, as I say, all the ampelographical information and we can go a bit more into the history and, and traditions of Sauvignon. But we'll crack straight on with the tasting. Um, so first thing we do when we look at it, if you tilt your glass away from you, Simon, and if you hold it over a piece of white paper or just something that's pale coloured, um, so sort of about 45 degrees away from you, so you're really spreading the wine out in the glass, it gives us an indication of what the colours are, and those colours then for give us an indication of what we're going to smell and taste. So if your wine has a, a really green tinge, a, that indicates youth. B, it's going to smell of green things and taste of green things. If your wine has a much darker, more yellow colour, your wine is going to smell and taste more of yellow things. And it, it's it's one of those things that sounds... Mm, delicious. Delicious. It's, it's one of those things in wine that sounds stupidly obvious, but actually it's, it is that, it's exactly that. It is stupidly obvious. It makes, it makes sense. Um, so... If you just smell the wine as it sat quite flat, just to begin with, you get some aroma and you get some fragrance from it. But this is why we now swirl in the glass. And if you're not comfortable doing it in the air, if you just stand the glass on the table, make a P sign either side of the stem and then just move it in a tight circle on the table. It does exactly the same action, but there's less dangerous spillage doing it that way. So you give the wine a good swish around in the glass. And then when you pop your nose in again, you will notice that the smell changes. There's more aroma, there's more strength to it. Um, and this is when, when we talk about letting wine breathe, this is exactly what we mean. By breathing air, you're getting wine 
through the air, so pouring it into a decanter, or you're getting air into the wine. And in this case, just swirling it in the glass gives you that effect. Oh, something we didn't point out, because um, I was about to say, if you pour less into the glass, the measures that we've got are oh, yeah, 100 we, mil. We've got our usual disclaimer. <laughs> yes. We've got the usual spiel, because the first one we did of these, I thought they were 50 mil and I drank it all. And then was a bit surprised that I was a little squiffy by the end of it. They are 100 mil. So if you drink a whole box to yourself, you've drunk nearly the bottle. Um, so, yeah, smells minty. Pop any comments or, or things you want to ask or just thoughts in the chat box. Uh, minty, yeah, there's definitely something herbal going on in there. Is there anything else that anybody wants to comment? What you can see, what you can smell? Melon. Marvellous. I would even go so far as to say white melon, <laughs> as opposed to yellow melon, which would be a much stronger smell. Good. Um, I'm getting something that's, it reminds me of peas, actually. That's P-E-E-S, not, sorry, P-E-A-S, -E I beg your pardon, not P-E-E-S. <laughs> got it the wrong way around. yellow things again. Unless, unless we're talking about cat, then that's, that's a different story altogether, but we might be moving on to that shortly. Um, yeah, so lots lots of green things. And then just on the palate, if we do the same sort of experiment, if you just take a sip of the wine and let it coat your tongue and just slip down your throat, it doesn't really give you an awful lot of texture, flavour, feeling. There's not that much going on. We replicate the swirling action by taking a small sip, then short, sharp breath. Um, if you have your chin down when you do that, it, it stops the wine just hitting the back of your throat and you don't choke on it because we'd, we'd rather not you choke on it. So small sip, short, sharp breath, and then just treat it like mouthwash, essentially. Just get as many as many points of your mouth hit by the wine as possible. We have pear as a comment as well, which I think is, is fair. Hmm? I say we have pear as one of the mm. comments as well, which we didn't pick mm -hmm. up. Yes. An apple. I've just realised I missed apple right at the beginning. Sorry, Nicky and Keys. My it, the chat had already moved up by that point. But definitely, oh, well, when yeah, I, just I missed that one as well. Sorry, I missed apple. Completely missed time. that. Yeah. Sorry. When I've just swelled it around my mouth, actually, the first thing I thought of was it's like I've just bitten into a Granny Smith apple. That really taut, sharp acidity, and then think, gosh, that's sharp. And the first sip will be. And if you do that swirling action again, the second sip will always be a little bit softer because that first sip, you feel the acidity here, sort of where your ears meet your jaw, basically, is what I call your hamster pouches. And that's where you feel the acidity. It sort of grips and you get the bitterness right across the middle of your tongue. And if you can still feel and taste the wine on the roof of your mouth, that's where we got, we, we call it the finish on wine, we try to avoid saying aftertaste, we say finish, <laughs> sounds much more elegant. Um, and yeah, you get a little tingle down the side of your tongue here. That's, it's a very fair point, actually, Linda. We know that wine, it, there's very, very few wines in the world that actually taste of, and smell of grapes. But yes, there is definitely a grapey note <laughs> to, to the Sauvignon Blanc. I think that's fair to say. What else have I got going on here? No so more. I think with, with this one, it's just sort of probably, I'll just quickly sort of, if, if um, whilst, whilst people are sort of putting those things in the comments, just go over the, the, the variety itself. So uh, it is quite an old variety, saving Yon Blanc. Um, and this first example that we've chosen is from, is from Chile, um, which I don't think, I don't know that we've mentioned that. Yeah, so this is from Chile. But it, know, was, from Chile. It, it was historically from um, France. So it originates from France and um, sort of around about the Loire um, and Bordeaux region. So that sort of area is where it, where it comes from. Um, and we'll taste some varieties from there um, a little bit later on. Um, but this, the region in Chile that this comes from, the Mall Valley, could be Mall, I don't know, I don't speak Chilean, um, <laughs> could be, could be is um, the oldest winemaking region in um, Chile. So the oldest vines in Chile tend to be um, in this in this place and it's possible because of the uh, the history of Sauvignon that this isn't entirely the same Sauvignon Blanc as you would get in France. So 
when the when the vines were originally taken over to Chile, when well, when the vines were originally um, found in Bordeaux, the 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 Sauvignon vines would be in vineyards alongside a few others. So Sauvignon Gris, which is translates as Sauvignon Grey as opposed to Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which creates a pink um, a pink wine, which is a mutation of Sauvignon Blanc. So very very similar. It's just a slight mutation. Um, and both of those came from a variety called Savang, Savangin, which comes from um, the Alps. Um, and so there is some suggestion that some of the varieties that made it over to Chile uh, originally were actually a combination, potentially further mutations or cross breedings between those. So whilst it is Sauvignon Blanc, it could potentially be a field blend, which includes Sauvignon Blanc, but some other slight variations as well. And it's, it may explain why it's getting slightly different tastes like grapes, um, which as Pip says, you don't often find in many grape varieties, but that might explain why you're getting that sort of grapey taste with it, as opposed to some of the more um, traditional saving your flavors. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I, I did mention it was Chilean. I just, oh, sorry. I, 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 no, I, I, wasn't really said that <laughs> I think, you, I think you were trying to find a cheese knife at the time. Yeah, okay, <laughs> or yeah, a okay. crown, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe a crown, yeah. <laughs> I think you were finding a crown. But yes, um, and it's worth pointing out, I will show you a map, of course, but in Chile, there's only about, so Chile is the very, 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 very long, very thin strip of land on the western coast of South America and there's only about the middle fifth that is actually suitable for growing fruit not just grapes but fruit so it's actually quite a small area and it's those of you that were here for the Argentinian tasting we talked about people planting grapes in and basically deserts and harvesting the meltwater off the Andes to irrigate the land so it made it possible to to grow grapes here, to grow any sort of crops here. And it's a very similar story, to be fair. But what's actually happening now in um, Chile, which I think is, is really interesting, is further north of where we are with this one, um, there's an area called Casablanca. And a lot of the big, big chains, the big brands that you will recognise walking into a supermarket and seeing wine from Chile, they have kind of monopolised that area and planted thousands and thousands and thousands of hectares of grapes. But now that the climate is changing slightly and actually resources are becoming less and less, fewer and fewer, many more of these producers are now moving to more southerly sites where it's slightly cooler and where it's less barren. So it's almost like we've, we've, we've gone into somewhere where we shouldn't grow something. We've made it possible to have agriculture there. And now we've over, harvested we've over planted we've over cropped and now we're moving away from the same area in order to recrop again which is quite interesting they've also got a massive problem with rabbits <laughs> just fyi <laughs> it's most most countries have problems with caterpillars and bugs and birds eating the grapes but in in chile it's mostly rabbits so they're they're trying to combat that by getting planting different crops that the rabbits like away from the vineyards so that they'll eat those and not the grapes. They don't just kill them and shoot them. That would be very, very cruel. This is all about sustainability and e e e ecological positiveness. So we, we, we keep the rabbits as much as possible, but just encourage them to pick elsewhere. Well, on the, on the note of sustainability, actually, but, um, uh, so actually oh, the, vineyard, the vineyard that it comes from is certified sustainable. So one of the things that we're, that we're trying to do more and more um, with the wines that we choose is um, is make sure that they are sustainable. Um, and there's lots of different certifications throughout the world, you know, the, starting with those that you might recognise like being organic or biodynamic, and then sort of going through a whole gamut of other sustainable um, sort of initiatives that people can take. So this one um, has been certified as sustainable by the, the, the wine board of Chile um, or the... Um, I can't remember what the actual name of it is. I don't know if you've got it there, Pip. This is the, no. the Chilean Wine Association. The Chilean, Chilean Wine, Wine Association. Association. Have, have certified this wine as sustainable. This vineyard is sustainable. So just while I try and find a pretty picture. Well, whilst Pip does that, food pairing. Shall we talk about food pairing? Oh, I was going to what? ask what if, if there's anything else that people have got, because now, now it's mine's just settled a little bit. It's actually becoming almost less fruity and more and more aromatic 
which is quite interesting. And I'm, some I'm one of the main it. reasons why we've got that is because there is quite a wide diurnal variation where we are here. Um, I've, I've mentioned it so many times, but for those that might not have heard it or missed it, grapes love sunshine but they don't like heat. If they have too much heat, they grow too quickly. If they have too much water, they grow too quickly. So we want lots and lots of sunshine, but cool temperatures. So Chile is perfect because you've always got an influence coming off the mountains. You've got an influence coming off the sea. And um, there's the Humboldt current, which is a, a cold air current and sea current that whooshes up from Antarctica. So that, that coastal side of, of Chile is always actually very, very, very cold even though you've got lots of sunshine. So in the daytime, you could have lovely temperatures up in the 30s in the summertime, but it can go down to as low as eight or 10 degrees at nighttime. And it's that difference, that diurnal variation that gives us aromatics. It gives the grapes time to really develop all these complex flavors and textures. And while Dan talks about food, I'll just put that into some. Sorry, I was just. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just one moving first. everything around because because of the sun shining behind me. Dan, um, can you make me host, please, so I can. So you can show your. Show everybody a picture. Yeah, I can. Sorry. Because uh, eight, sometimes. It's thirteen percent, Chris. Okay. Sometimes, I think we assume that white wine is made from green grapes, and actually often that is the case but with this particular grape variety can i share yet yeah i've made you host oh there it is i found the button right share this this is what ripe sauvignon blanc grapes look like if you can all see that so actually they're a lot more yellow than you'd realize but there's still a green tinge to them so that's why often when you see it in the glass some of them depending on where it's grown will be a very very almost sort of steely gray green color whereas the one we've got now is it's got a bit more of a yellow tinge but just to put it into context that's what they look like oh dan's moving in his kitchen and a map for you all because i know you've all been waiting for the map let me find this Sorry, I was aware of the back that it was backlighting me and I was just looking like a silhouette. You were silly hooted, definitely. Right, so let me screen share this one. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Did you not like the view of my garden? <laughs> Very pretty tulips. So where, okay, I'll zoom out. Can you all see the map? Is that, has that come up? Yes, we can see the map, yes. Perfect. So that's Chile. We're not, we haven't even got all of Chile yet. I don't know if it'll all fit on. There we are. So basically from the edge of Bolivia, you can see the Atacama Desert at the top. Nothing's getting through the Atacama Desert. Not a living single organism exists in the Atacama Desert because it's far too hot and it's far too dry. There's nothing there. And then all the way down into Patagonia, that is Chile. But it's only really this little patch where the cursor is now where grapes fruit full stop grows and this particular one comes from a little town called San Javier this is the my um the Mall Valley and you can see the mountains you've got the Andes to the left right even the Andes to the right you've got a mountain range that heads down into the sea which I apologize you do not know the name of so it's just this big valley right in the middle which is where the mall is and if we keep going you can see where all the vineyards are. Isn't it pretty? Oh, it's so beautiful. I'm not sure what the big circles are. I don't know if they have crop circles in Chile, actually. Look. Oh yeah, how interesting. Oh yeah, I not, didn't notice, and there's one there, look. I didn't notice that before. Maybe they have, maybe it's the UFOs doing, the, doing what they do in vineyards. The aliens coming to the grapes. There um, you go. Yeah. Well, I do know of a winemaker in California that claims that the, the aliens help make his wine the way it is because he's he's very, very hippie and out there. He, he might be on something to believe that, but they're very, very good wines. But that's by the by. You can really see the, the valley structure going on there. And that's what we want to highlight. So you've got a wind that will come down the valley. You've got a wind that comes off the mountains you've got a wind that comes off the sea so everything is just kept really 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 cool and fresh so we've got this lovely citrusy but aromatic style 
Is that Hugo? It is. Hi, Hugo. And I think it's it's probably worth just highlighting. Uh, it's again like with everywhere. Where everywhere we go, and we we sort of talk about wines and we talk about the places. Quite often, it's a valley, isn't it? And there's a river, and it's the river is is having a cooling influence on the on the overall uh, geography of the of the location. And then, and you know, fairly typically, as with all the places that we talk about. You know, the best sites tend to be just as you're coming up that slope in the valley. So if you imagine looking down the river um, at the valley and you see the, the you know, the, the villages going up the, the valley, quite often the best plots where you'll find the vines will be as the slope just tends to sort of, just as it's starting to go up the sides of the valley. Um, and that's where, you know, we everywhere we look, we're always, we're always seeing. And you'll see from lots of other places that we look at later, but it's it's often a valley, it's often a river river influence that we get. We we didn't talk about food, did we? Because you because you were no, I, I distracted you with maps. Sorry. Should we, should we quickly talk about food? Let's so please. If people want to sort of say what they maybe paired with it and what they or what they think they could pair with it. Oh, um, I, was, I was about to say show us your nibbles, but that I'm, <laughs> hey. show us your nibbles. <laughs> Is this going to be a new catchphrase? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So <laughs> one thing that we've we've touched on the sort of the fruitiness and the flavours and the aromatics that we're getting, but can you all feel that acidity on the side of your cheeks there? It's really, really characteristic of Sauvignon Blanc. So in order to complement the acidity in wine, we want food that has acidity. So I'm not expecting anyone to bring out a plate of fish and chips with a wedge of lemon on it and some tartar sauce, but please feel free to surprise me. Um, often one of the simplest things that has acidity is cheese. Granted it's lactic acid, it's a very different form of acidity, but also cheese is very fatty. So we're, we're cutting through the fat and we're complementing the acidity. And goat's cheese works best simply because um, in the Loire Valley, where actually our next example comes from. So if you just see what I did there, if you want to move on to the well, second well, wine, please well. do feel free <laughs> because this wine is from the Loire Valley and the Loire Valley is also very famous for its goat's cheese. So you have the two together and suddenly the acidity is balanced. The fruitiness almost feels more fruity, but you also tend, because there's a, again, this sounds silly. It's like saying wine tastes of grapes. Goat's cheese to me always smells and tastes of grass, freshly cut grass. I thought you were so going to say goat's out... then. I thought you were going to say yeah, yeah, goat's cheese smells of goats. Oh no, no I, I do have a friend who I can't enjoy goat's cheese in his presence because he cannot stand the smell of goat's cheese to the point where I, I can't eat it in front of him. <laughs> Selfish, I know. But so yeah. have your, try your second wine and try it with the, if you have goat's cheese or a sheep's cheese, if you weren't able to get a goat's cheese, but frankly, any sort of cheese. I've got a brie here and a pecorino because I was very limited for time on going shopping. So I, I was- I, I have a goat's cheese. And it is, it is, it works really well. The first one works really well with the goats. So the first one, so I've also got, because um, Sauvignon Blanc, those green notes that you get often from Sauvignon Blanc that we've spoken about, um, is one of the wines that actually pairs really well with um, with asparagus. And it is the English asparagus season um, mm -hmm. at the moment. So oh. I have some asparagus, which I am pairing with it. Although I think that the first one, um, I didn't think that the aromatics were quite strong enough to really go with yes. the with the asparagus, whereas with the goat's cheese, it was wonderful. I would agree. And I think we showed that first one first for exactly that reason. It's the most commercial of the wines that we're showing today. Um, and it is it's a perfectly pleasant, quaffable sitting in the garden terrace kind of wine. But one thing I've just remembered I completely forgot to say at the start of the tasting happy international Sauvignon Blanc day everybody <laughs> there is a reason we chose today yeah. to do the Sauvignon Blanc tasting and it's because it's international Sauvignon Blanc day I can't believe I forgot well no because I was thinking with it being the coronation we should be doing English wine today but of course we're doing I know, that in... but we're doing that in June yeah we're doing that uh, sorry in June not next month yeah in, in June 
And that I is think, next why, did we choose, why did we choose Sauvignon Blanc? And yes, of course, it is because it's International <laughs> Sauvignon Blanc Day today. <laughs> like we need an excuse, Lyndon and Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, I mean, I don't know if anyone's, uh, who, well, obviously Lyndon and Elaine never knows this, but my goodness, isn't that a different um, kettle of fish to the first one? Yeah, I like Chris's comment about um, he's had it with the cheese and this seems sweeter. There's just a lot more happening, even even if when you swirl in the glass in front of me, I'm not actually having to put it to my face to smell it. Yeah. There's yeah, when you, I don't know if anybody else there. poured poured them beforehand. I always pour my wines into the glasses before we start. And this one, and I think number five, which is the Peter Volker, both of them, when I poured them, you just got this wonderful aroma coming Whish. from both of them. Yeah, it just filled the room, um, which is really super. And it's so what we, we meant, sorry, we mentioned earlier about the, the sort of where Sauvignon Blanc came from originally. And here we are now in the Loire Valley. So we are um, pretty close to where Sauvignon Blanc originated from. And can I say a little bit about the Loire Valley? please do you want a map <laughs> excuse me and so for people that are familiar with the Loire Valley um you may be you may have heard of Sancerre which is in this area um but we're not sure and Sancerre yeah it's called Sancerre because it's named after the village like lots of wines in France um but actually Sancerre is made from Sauvignon Blanc um but what we've chosen to show you is um, a wine that comes from the Loire Valley, so just lower down the valley, um, and comes from the town of, or the region of Terrain, so Sauvignon de Terrain. So if this reminds you a little bit of Sancerre, there's a good reason why it might. Only it's better value. That's the that's much the better value, and that's exactly value. why that's something that comes across in in most of our tastings, isn't it? Yes, we have some slightly more treat wines going in there, but there's always something that you can say. Actually, this is just down the road, and it's the same thing, but you're not paying for the fact that it says Sancerre or Pouli Fume is another one, the town of Pouli sur Loire, which is just across the road from Sancerre, in fact. But it's like everything. It's like Adidas or Kellogg's. You're paying for the name. So look out for Touraine. It's it's such amazing value. So just show of hands or pop it in the chat, whichever's better. But comparing this one to the one we had previously, either whether you've had it with or without food. Um, sorry, just a quick check. Salted crisps. How's it going, Nikki? <laughs> Excellent. Good. Just checking. <laughs> um would you say that this one is as fruity as the first one or is it more vegetal who thinks it's more fruity who thinks it's more vegetal you put your hand up twice Pip. <laughs> and i was just demonstrating that's what oh. <laughs> <laughs> um so just personally, in case people weren't sure how to put their hand up. It was just, uh, just in case. Um, so we've got split votes, and this is what fascinates me. We are all tasting exactly the same wine. We all had exactly the same wine to start with, but how our palates and how our brains is now processing the information of what we're smelling and tasting is going to be different for everybody. Because to me, this is much more grassy. This is like I've just I love in I live in a, an area called the Blackdown Hills. So if I go outside, it's just grass. I can smell the hay. I can smell the fresh cut grass. It's just beautiful. And that's what this reminds me of. Or walking through a woodland. There's something very when I say woody, I don't mean that it's been in a barrel woody. I mean, actually being in the wood woody. There's something very just natural and organic and earthy about this wine. And, and I that's, think that's pretty but, typical of, of wines from the Loire, isn't it? I mean, where Sancerre would yeah. be the same. Um, it's that it typically tends to be those those greener notes. Why is that? So, Hugo's crazy. Hugo wants out. But to others, it's going to come across as um, as it did to Lyndon and Lane. It's going to come across as more peachy, more nectarine, more apple. There's there's different layers in there. <gasps> Oh no, children, run away. <laughs> I've, I've shown everybody your crown, Barnaby. Would you like to, would you like yes. to? Hello, Barnaby. Hello, Alice. To model it for us. They do get to taste everything with us, by the way. They've <laughs> <laughs> no, just come back from cricket. So. I can tell. All stars. 
good so yes to some this is going to be more floral and vegetal to some this is going to be more fruity but hopefully um is there anyone that on the call that is big fans of Sancerre or Puli Fume and that's sort of what you would go towards how would you say this compares are you pleasantly surprised thumbs up mm, not sure if we take it as a consideration of value for money perhaps yeah <laughs> I, I like the hmm. it's if you look at the price of this one these days you're looking probably double for the for the price of a Sancerre because just like um Burgundy recently has had terrible vintages quality is high but yield is very low it's a similar story in in um Loire Valley unfortunately so some some Sancerre and Puli Fume are prices are just getting higher and higher and higher every year so something like this is actually really, really good value for money. And I just want to put it into context in a moment by showing you um, find the village where we are. And then I will share so you can see the geography of what we're looking at. Share screen, this one. Right, so this is Oily, the town of Oily. And again, just look at all those beautiful vineyards. But also, please note, as I zoom out, whereas with the Chilean one, you had the valleys on either side. Here, we've got little pockets of forest that you can see. That's the darker areas. But it's it's relatively flat. You you get undulation. As, as a runner, we call it lumpy. It's a little bit lumpy. You've got undulating um, areas of land, but there aren't any massive land masses particularly. And you can see the Loire River here just running through. So the Loire, little fact, fun fact for you, is the longest river entirely in France. It actually starts about here in, in the um, Massif Central, and then it flows all the way down through the middle of France, through Sancerre, there we are. There's Sancerre, go away. Sancerre and Pouli sur Loire, that's where we get Pouli Fume from. And then it carries on north and then comes back round and eventually ends up, oh, there's Tour. So that's why the region is called Terrain, because the main town is Tour. You've got Angers nearby, which is beautiful, by the way. It's a really good place to go and visit actually here. They call it the Garden of France. And it's just really, really pretty. And then we go all the way down to Nantes by the sea, which is where we get Muscadet from. So you could have a jolly old time just driving through the Loire Valley. It's very, very pretty, but you can see there. So this is the little, this is where our, our wine has come from in terrain. And actually it's only about 40 kilometers away from Sancerre. So in terms of style, it's very, very similar, but in terms of price, it's a lot, lot cheaper. And I think in con contrast to the, to the first one we had, um, I don't know if Chris has asked the question yet, I'm sure he will. Um, so ABV is 12%. And so the reason why we're getting lower alcohol the reason why we're getting more green flavors is because of temperature isn't it um because here we're we're a lot cooler here than we are in chile and so you don't get the ripeness in the grapes and so that you don't get the sugar which means you don't get the alcohol which means you don't get the the those riper flavors that's why the flavors that we get from this tend to be much more on that sort of herbal side and um, i've just i've just tried it with the asparagus and this one is a much better a much better match for the asparagus so if you're having some english asparagus i would uh, yeah recommend sancerre or terrain sauvignon um for, for the better value or possibly even although i haven't tried any i know it exists english sauvignon pip it is out there but it's it'll take the enamel off your teeth should we go with Bacchus instead then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd put it on your fish and chips, not with it, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I, haven't, just I, need... haven't, I, know, I know people are growing it. I haven't tried it yet. It's, we, we need a little bit more heat. Just a little yeah. bit more heat. We need, yeah, for now. I'm sure there are some very good examples out there, but certainly the ones I've tried have been very... There's only, there's only two that I know of and I haven't tried either, either of them. Um, one of them comes from Cornwall. And um, and one of them is made in Axminster. Um, mm. I wonder who that is that you're talking about. Anyway, 
<laughs> yes, they're very sharp, very sharp. Does anyone have any questions or further comments? This one is um, Ash Ve'e, by the way, again, yes, certified yes. Um, sustainable, the highest level of sustainability and eco e ecologically friendliness that you can get in France without it being certified organic, basically. <laughs> Because you'll find there's more and more apologies. I've got the gooeyest brie ever. <laughs> you'll find that with the changes in the EU regulations about what can be classed as organic, it's actually not that higher level. It's it's really quite limited to what, or sorry, very um, lenient. I guess is the better word for what you need to uh, achieve to be classed as organic by EU standards. And it basically covers you're not using anything that hasn't come from plant or animal. And that's about it. It doesn't consider your impact on the soil. It doesn't consider how you're um, encouraging wildlife and biodiversity in the vineyards. It doesn't encourage, um, you know, little things like recycling your cardboard or recycling your water or how you treat your people or anything like that. So there's this HVE, ash, -E, so um, highest environmental value basically it stands for and just I, I, I just value environmental. yeah i'll just do it in um, english it's easier <laughs> <laughs> i just want to show you a couple of beautiful beautiful pictures and so there's, there's there's a logo for hve which um you'll, you'll see on lots of wines now that we get from france so lots of the wines we get from france are hve um, so they have this this certification. Um, also, interestingly, so the, the the couple that make this, um, Isabel and Noah, uh, Noah are uh, their yeah. fifth generation. So so again, fairly typical in France. You, you know, from if you've been with us on French tastings before, um, you know it, it tends to be a family a family um, profession quite often. So um, their family started in 1885 um, on the site that they're on now, uh, growing the vines. So they've yeah, lots of experience of um, of making and lots of passion for making wines. And um, I think they do a pretty good job, actually. Thumbs up or thumbs down? What do people think on this one? Lots Ooh. of thumbs up that I can see there. Lots That's of good. thumbs up. Lots of thumbs up. I, yeah. So where, where my screen is, all I can see is, is four little Union Jacks doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking that as nodding. Hooray. <laughs> um, I just want to show you a couple of pictures as well, just from this vineyard. So this is them. This is their harvesting machine, which, as you can see, it's at the crack of dawn. If you harvest very, very early in the morning, your grapes stay cool. If you want to encourage more richness and texture and weight in the wine, you might wait until the middle of the middle of the morning to harvest when some of the sugars are higher and also it gives more texture but if you leave you want your wine to be really really fresh and clean you will usually harvest it first thing in the morning and I think that picture represents that quite nicely and then we've also got this beautiful picture which is again from their vineyards and this was from their Facebook page because they just really wanted to shout about how diverse they are. Isn't he beautiful? Gorgeous, massive butterfly. So they try to avoid using pesticides as much as possible. So if they can encourage certain natural predators into the vineyard, you don't need to intervene quite as much. So that's what he is. Or she, perhaps. I didn't ask. <laughs> Your, your your butterfly sexing is not up to scratch. But uh, sorry, I must must hard try bit. harder. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> must try harder. Don't even know the species. I apologise. <laughs> but butterfly, <laughs> butterfly brown one. Yeah. Um, brown, so is everyone brown, brown is everyone happy to move on to the next one, or do you have any questions? Three was that three keys? Three questions. Three yeah. <laughs> wine. Three <laughs> marvelous. So we're going south, aren't we now? We're going down, we're going from yeah, France, we're going to go south. on a journey down into, into Italy. So we're heading further south. So Only uh, just. Only just. Is it is it not particularly far south from... Um, from uh, only just into Italy. Italy. Oh, right, yes, okay, yes. I so mean... we are going south, but only just into Italy. I see what you're saying. But slightly further south, so slightly warmer, slightly riper. Is that what we're expecting? Well, 
we've got different things going on here. I'm glad you asked that, Dan. It's like you've been prompted or something. I genuinely, he hasn't. Uh, definitely a butterfly, Chris. Sorry, it wasn't a moth. Definitely a butterfly. Um, so I'm going to start with a map on this one. You guys can obviously start with your tasting. So we're going from France and we're going to move into an area called Friuli, New, Friuli Venezia Giulia to give it its, front, its full name, which clearly in Yorkshire doesn't, doesn't do very well, Julia. Um, this is the bit in red, is the area of Friuli for short. And you can see there's bits in there called Alp. So even though we've moved south and we're in Italy, we're in the Alps. So there's going to be multifacets to this wine. There are going to be elements that are riper and more rich, possibly a little bit more tropical fruit because we're going further south. So you get a little bit more sunshine. But because we are in the Alps, you're also going to have this wonderful aromatic, um, sounds cliched, but sort of alpine florals, alpine herbs, something that is just a bit more fragrant, shall we say, a bit more floral bit more aromatic so what do you think what are you getting does that come through oh two new messages my my chat isn't moving oh, close to the second land we are we are close to orange we are quite close yeah i we can are, show you yeah, so, so, veneto is where prosecco generally comes from so not too... yeah so so yeah the the bit in the red dots is fuelly venezia julia but where prosecco well technically prosecco can be made anywhere in italy it's a process not a geographical um designation but the best tends to come from Veneta and even more specific Treviso is a is a good place for it but there's I don't think I'll be able to find them off the top of my head there's basically three towns that are the best if you ever see a Prosecco with the words Conegliano, Valdebiadini or Asolo on them Chris, they Chris are the best way ahead of you, what's he put I'm sorry Chris, I can't Chris see my chat now Val Right, one more time, one more time, Dan. Go on. <laughs> but don't worry, we've got we've got press up the coming up later. Um, <laughs> well, the beer daily. Yay! Well done. Italy's easy. You just pronounce every letter that you can say. Oh, that's Conegliano. I just found it. Yes. Val Bedini, Conegliano, and Asolo will be somewhere close as well. But yes, you're right. So right next yeah, to. Mark, what, whilst you're looking at Mark's coming up with peach and floral, which I think, yeah, is good. Katie, um, just off camera, tasted it. Katie, Katie suggested banana um, as uh, one of the, the, the things that she could smell. Um, so it's definitely uh, sort of riper tropical fruits that are coming through, I think. Definitely. Yeah, much less green fruit. Katie, oh, said, is, Katie said, is she right? Can <laughs> anybody else get banana? <laughs> Chris, Christopher's nodding. Chris, Chris is getting banana. Yes, well done, Kate. well done, Katie. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Oh, could Louise said, could you just on the map? Could you show the whole of Italy so we can? Oh, I beg your pardon. It's yes, really of course. Normal, sorry. Louise, so it's almost on the border of. Um, it's of basically sort of Austria. Austria. So it's really, yes, it's really far, really far north. It's it's basically Austria and Slovenia, or it's are its neighbours. Sorry, so that's where Austria, we are. Sorry, I said Switzerland. Sorry, my my mistake. Austria. No, Switzerland's that side. Yes. This this here, Slovenia. It's the Dolomites. Is where we are. Does that help? And yeah, right down into Trieste. Look, it's beautiful. And in fact, I think. I think. Wait. There we are. I have a picture. Is that the right one? That is the vineyards where Il Casato is made. And this is the Dolomites, the, the foothills in inverted commas of the Dolomites in the background. Isn't it beautiful? Beautiful. It is beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Gorgeous. But yeah, much richer. I just had a, I just had a taste of this. It's much richer um, profile to it. Um, the previous one was very lean. You know, love the ingredients. This one's got, it's still got nice acidity with it. And there's still some of those green flavours, I think, just coming down the bitterness, coming down the middle of the palate. 
but it's it's richer around the outside um for Ooh. me and i That's think sorry I, wonderful almost almost manga finish yeah um, and another thing that I really, really, really want to point out on this one and the next one, actually, um, it's 2019. We've sort of always been conditioned that Sauvignon Blanc, you must drink it when it's really young because it's all about the aromatics and the greenness and the freshness. I think this one just proves actually this is nearly four years old and it's still holding its own. It's still got a lot of weight and a lot of texture. You don't have to put your hand up, Dan. <laughs> I don't want to get told off for interrupting you, Pip. Um, but you say we've been conditioned to always drink Sauvignon Blanc young. But actually, you know, single varietal Sauvignon Blanc, as we know it, is a relatively modern invention. Um, then... And actually, if you look at where Sauvignon Blanc was used, then we'll move on shortly to that, but not just the next example, but also uh, think about things like Sauterne or Barsac, where it's being used um, as the major component of a sweet wine. Those aren't wines that you want to drink when they're super young. Those are wines that are going to evolve and mm. enhance with time. So I don't mm. think it's that bizarre. I know it's. I know in terms of what we're sort of talking about. I think what for think. what we see, for what we see commercially, because there's so yeah. much New Zealand Sauvignon, there's so much Chilean Sauvignon out on the market, and there, I mean, gosh, New Zealand Sauvignon, bear in mind there, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute anyway, but bear in, and Chile, bear in mind their harvest is, well, just happened, happening. So a 23 New Zealand and Chilean Sauvignon will be on our supermarket shelves by the end of summer, before the end of summer. So it's super, super, super fresh and clean. Whereas this one, they've said, no, just let's just wait a minute. We're gonna, we're just gonna keep it. Just let it rest in stainless steel tanks and just leave it to just be a little while. And it gives you something with much more complexity, I think. It's but more... we grab something off the supermarket shelf. What's your fact, Dan, about how soon a bottle is drunk after oh, it's, it's been reached off the it's supermarket ridiculous. shelf? It's like 17 so minutes long... or something. Yeah, with, with from from the bottle going off the shelf to being drunk, it's about twenty two minutes. I think it's something crazy. The average length of time that a bottle lasts <laughs> once it leaves the supermarket. It's you know it's a really ridiculous statistic about how quickly it is. I mean, I'm intrigued by by Keith's reaction. Was just big eyes there. I'm wondering if you're considering that too too short or too long. <laughs> twenty two minutes. God. <laughs> They're not even trying. They want, to, they want to put some effort into their drinking. Get a straw, upside down, um, torpedo. Um, I guess it does pedo. depend, stropedo, I guess it does depend how close to the supermarket you live, doesn't it, really? Yeah. But it's, but yeah, I mean, we drink, we drink all wine too young, I think, or well, most wines too young, you know, so many wines. And I, and I had a really interesting chat with a winemaker um, during COVID. And Have you got a picture said, of you two together? <laughs> probably somewhere um, <laughs> but he was saying that they th this particular winery took a decision in covid not because they weren't selling anything to actually just sit on their stock for an extra year um because they had the funds to, to allow them to do that so they basically closed the winery down for the year you know other than just doing the absolute essential they didn't do any selling and what that meant was they could actually then release that wine the, the, the next year when it was actually better for having spent that 12 months in bottle which is something they never normally get the opportunity to do they are they always you know because of the demand all wineries have to keep moving their wine through I, we were we were tasting if anyone was with us at Toby's last weekend um at the Toby's Garden Festival you know we had a Barolo on the show though which I was tasting with people is in 2017 and I was like everyone that wanted to taste it I was explaining to them this is you know it needs probably another 10 20 years yet before it's yeah. ready but the winery obviously has to move it out of their their cellars so they sell it to us you know it's sort of when it's when it's when it's five or six years old and of course you know we don't want to sit on it either so we we sell it on so for those of you that have the luxury of a, of a cellar or somewhere you can store your wine it's it's great to actually put some of it aside and and give it a, a you know a year or several years to see how it evolves um, and I'm glad that um, Lyndon and Elaine have commented, this wine gets better the more it rests. It's already rested in the bottle. And the more you just let it sit in the glass. I don't know when people took their packs out the fridge, but mine came out the fridge about an hour ago. So they're not cold, cold. 
but this is definitely an example of where having a white wine not fridge cold is of benefit hmm. gives I you more flavor it gives you more texture i'm i'm pairing this one with smoked trout is it good it works works really well actually um, oh, I think christopher because the smoked trout is really rich um and this is cut rich, through that cuts think, through the fattiness to cut through the fattiness yeah i think it i think it's a good it's the best combination i've found with the smoked trout so far so the 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 first one was great with the goat's cheese the second one was great with the asparagus and the third one is working wonderfully with the smoked trout still still good with brie <laughs> still good with brie still good with brie um <laughs> and salted crisps yeah yeah no, still, still good, good. <laughs> Everything goes in solid crisp. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to try it with the goat's cheese again. But shall we? Um, yes. Do we Let's. have any, any any other questions or any other comments on number three before we move on to number four? Marvelous. Chris, be positive. You're here for a while yet. Don't worry. <laughs> so are you in London? Are you in London or Seaton at the moment, Chris? London. So number four, we're moving, mm. um, we're moving back into France. So we're going probably not that far north because we're going to Bordeaux. So we're not going. We're probably not too different in terms of. Um, shall we see? Shall have a look, yeah. But we're also um, doing something crazy here, <laughs> um, which is which is we're not just using Sauvignon Blanc. So this is a blend. Um, which is pretty so people may not realize one that Bordeaux does white wine so some people might just think Bordeaux red wine um actually Bordeaux has a small percentage of, of white wine um and the white wine that they make um generally is a blend of Sauvignon Blanc um, and Semillon and this one is um a 60% Sauvignon Blanc and 40% Semillon um, so I haven't picked it up yet, I haven't smelt it, I haven't tasted it, but what I would expect um, is that the semion just adds something to the, sorry, Hugo's barking in the background. Just <laughs> While Dan sorts the dog out, sorry, life, uh, we said we're going up into France. Can you see my map? Hang on. Yes, we're not, are we? We're we actually going further south. I know. So this, this is where we were before in the northeast. And if we come straight across, I know there's a bit of a curve, but we're actually going down into Bordeaux, which is a surprise to me. And so that's Bordeaux town. Um, if we keep going in, the thing that I want to show you, where's the Garonne? There's the Garonne. Where's the Gironde gone? There it is. I've gone too far out. So um, on your sheet, it says that this wine is called, on, or the, the area where it's from is called Entre de Mer. Very, very loosely, that means between two seas. And this is why. So this is the, 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 the more southerly river is the Garonne. The more northerly river is the Dordogne. And then they join to form the Gironde, which is where the majority of the first growths and things like Poyac and um, Pomerol and Saint Emilion and Margot and all the wonderful names that you'll have heard of come from. So between those two rivers, or as I say loosely, between two seas in the middle, this is where you tend to find a lot of the white wine. Um, traditionally, it was because it was cheaper land because you can't grow as much red wine on there. It's generally a mixture of clay and gravel and Cabernet Sauvignon prefers gravel so that tends to be more southerly and Merlot prefers clay so that tends to be more northerly. Um, did you not just see the map? No map? Oh wait. Oh I, I, I think we did but I think it might maybe it was just very brief. Right let me let me find it again apologies. Yeah right. whilst, whilst it's fine now I'll just, I'll just finish it. so what I was saying is, is the semion um, before I got into the dog, the semillon should just fill this out. So I think Pip said at the very start, it's a very linear, tends to be a very linear grape, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So it has this very clean line, this very clean fruit line. And we, we sort of described lots of the flavours. 
Whereas what we're doing now, and often with blending, you know, we think that single varietals are the best. You know, when, when you go to the, to, the, to, the, to the shops to buy wine, you look for those things that you recognize, you know, whether that's a Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough, you know, whether that's, mm. um, uh, you know, a, a, a Cabernet Sauvignon or whatever it might be. Lots of people look for these single varietals. And it's over the past maybe 30 years, it's become much more popular to have single varietals. Whereas actually, you know, historically, blends were, were, were what, what most winemakers made. Um, and because what you end up with is a wine that is more than the sum of its parts. So you get that very clean, linear acidity that comes from the Sauvignon, but then the Semillon should fill it out with this sort of rounded, creamy, almost buttery um, mm. element that, that creates a wine that has, has the Sauvignon's acidity, but then has this sort of full mouthfeel that you get from the Semillon. And a, a wine made entirely of Semillon might be a bit dull, um, whereas a wine made from the two actually should be a really interesting and exciting mm. I, haven't, I still haven't smelled it or tasted it, so I'm oh. hoping that that all bears out. Well, I just want to pick up on Lindsay and Elaine's comment. I've tried this before and didn't like it. There's a hint of spirit slash brandy. That is, that is the Semillon. So Semillon, if you had it by itself, we describe it as sort of orange peel and lanolin. There's something very waxy about it. And that's that. It's, how can I describe it? it? It's like the pithy part of when you peel an orange and a lot of people just don't get on with it at all. Semillon can be very, very polarizing. But do you like this version, Lyndon Lane? Not as much. So Lyndon Lane, no, definitely. Not fans, but you know to avoid. It's that blend of, so most um, Bordeaux white will be a blend. So bear that in mind. Um, a lot of the time, if you go to Margaret River um, in Australia, they they have a climate that's actually very, very similar, excuse me, to Bordeaux. So you often find they do a lot of sem sorbs, they call them, or sorb sems, depending on which way around they do it. Um, did you all know? That's a good point, actually. Whichever word comes first is the one that has the greater quantity. So if it's a like sorb sem, it'll pie. have... Huh? Like meat and potato pie. Or, as they have to be rightly called now, potato and meat pie. There you go. <laughs> Got a great analogy. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> yeah, so if, it, if it's sort of sem, it's more Sauvignon than Semillon. If it's the other way around, it's more Semillon than Sauvignon. But, yeah, I mean, Dan and I do these sessions to, to show you what's out there and show you the possibilities. Not everybody is going to like every single wine. And it's it's as important to understand what you're not so keen on as much as what you are keen on. So we know that you're not fans of, of Semillon and you remember that. But yeah, it's that very waxy, oily kind of quality that you get from it. But just hopefully, I've got my map up again and I will I will talk. Can you now see the map? Lyndon and Elaine get germaline, by the way. I don't know if you spotted germaline. that. Germaline, nice. That's, that's I, I think I just, I just flicked off for that one. Um, yeah, germaline. so this this is the map. So um, I'll come back out just in case you didn't see it before. So we were across here in Friuli, and now we're going across to France, but down a little bit into Bordeaux. So I'll bring him into the centre. So Bordeaux is this great big long river the um, Gironde, which is formed of two smaller rivers, the Dordogne at the north and the Garonne to the south. And this bit in between, that is the Entre de Mer, the between two seas, which as I say, historically has been known as being the sort of the lesser area of Bordeaux because it's not great for reds particularly, but the whites that come out of there are absolutely fantastic. And this is where you get sauternes from as well. So it's really, really good. Uh, let me stop that. But yeah, hopefully you can see. It's from Press at Lyon Mon as well. Mm. Which, which, well. which, which you can't say properly. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> thank you, Christopher, for making that comment. It's a tenor. Yeah. It's a tenor. I think that is extraordinary value for money. When you well, consider you, I, to get a 
a high quality red from Bordeaux is much, much, much more expensive. To get a high quality Sauvignon from France, as we say, if you go further north into Loire Valley, it's much, much, much more expensive. So for a tenner, for a good sem, sort of, sort of sem, I should say, it's actually extremely good value for money. And whether you like it or dislike it, as Dan said, you've got the Sauvignon notes, the freshness, the herbaceous qualities, but then that semillon just really gives you a mouthfeel, which with, with quite old brie is really good, by the way. <laughs> still still on the brie. It what, works with the, I... the smoke trap. Um, Thought but I was also going to say, because you mentioned about, you said you mentioned it's, it's entre de mer, so it's between these um, two C's, in inverted commas. Um, and actually, if you're looking for value in Bordeaux, whether it's white or red, um, Entre de, de Mers is a yes. really good um, place to look out for because it's where, um, you know, some really good value comes from. This was actually, it was a swamp until about 1780 um, when the Dutch um, came in and drained it. So, good old um, Dutch. Yeah, the good old Dutch draining the it's swamp. what they're good at, draining things, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, so this was, this was unplantable. Um, you know, for most of history, and then yeah, the great the, the Dutch came along, drained it, and that's where um, the yeah the, the vines got planted on it. But yeah, for white or red, um, look for it on a label, and uh, and generally you're getting pretty good value. I love I love Lisa's just very sagely nodding to yes, the Dutch. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> clever, clever Dutch. Clever Dutch. Um, Fog, windmills, and drains. Tulips. Tulips. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And holding back the water. <laughs> um, um, can I just say, I made, I made, as well as the other bits that I had earlier, I've also made a little green salad, um, which is with lots of different herbs in there. Um, and actually, this works really well with the um, with, with this one. Nice. So the, the herbs oh, that shall, I, shall I run out and get some wild garlic from the garden? That's I, all wild garlic would work really well, actually. I think, yeah. <laughs> really would. Yeah, um, honestly, I am slightly obsessed with wild garlic i will make anything that is physically possible to make out of wild garlic it's i love it absolutely love the stuff so we move on before i wax lyrical about wild garlic cookery um number five are we on we're on number five before, sorry before we move on because yes. we have sort of been mentioning the sustainability um about yep. different places and the guys that make this, so Chateau um, Cantaloudet, which is the name, is actually made by um, a cooperative called Caves de Rosin, um, which is a huge cooperative in, in, the, in the region. Um, there's sort of, um, I think about 300 um, members of the cooperative that all provide their grapes to go into the wines. Um, and they have the highest certification um, of the again of not of HVA this time HVA it's a AFNOR A F N O R but it's the highest certification they can get basically in that particular scheme. So um, and one of the things that they do is um, they and Pip Pip mentioned it earlier in terms of organic just looks at the, the 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 sort of the green bits that are going into it. Whereas actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to consider a lot more than that and the wineries are and try and find ways of ensuring that what we're doing is is not just doing the, the green bits, but also, you know, looking where else they can make um, savings in terms of sustainability, in terms of the environment. Um, and they they recycle 99% of their waste. So that's one of the things that they do in this particular winery. So they have they have an incredible recycling um, program that they use. Um, and they also, um, and they, they recycle their water as well. So they actually recycle their wastewater, which they then use on the vineyards. Um, and so there's lots of sort of um, there's lots of initiatives that are happening um, in vineyards where people are aware of the fact that they need to be more um, environmentally aware, and they're finding these initiatives that will you know save water, save waste, um, and, and so these guys are sort of at the forefront of doing it in the region. So. Happy, we like that a lot. Shall we pop to South Africa for a little bit? Oh, let's. Let's. Yes. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not? So this was another one of the wines. I said when I poured all six wines at the start, um, number two really leapt out of the glass, mm. but as did number five. So when I just opened the packet and poured it, the whole room filled with these amazing aromas. And this is totally different, isn't it, to mm. you know, number two had these incredible 
green notes, vegetal notes to it. This one, I think we are definitely on the on the tropical scale. Yeah, we're and yet what's, what's really interesting is this is probably the most green that I've seen of them. Yeah. Just tilting it over my sheet here. Oh, it's really, really, really green. Mean. It's got yeah. a lot of colour. Yeah. But in terms of the, the aromas, mm. you know, it it's is very tropical. Passion fruit, isn't it? It's mm. it's almost like um like lilt. <laughs> like a can of lilt. Oh like. no, I I've had somebody once describe something like this as umbonga. Which is a very, Bongo, yes. you have to I be of a certain age to get that. The Congo, they drink um, it in the Congo, yes. <laughs> or five alive. Yeah, for me, this is guava. Yes, and it's guava. only actually very, very recently, um, like the last 18 months or so, that I actually smelt what guava actually smells like. Because I, um, a the company, nothing to do with wine, actually. It was a company, but they did these drinks that had, um, it was, I'm trying to remember what the other ingredient was, grapefruit and guava, possibly, or raspberry and guava. It was raspberry and guava. And when we did a trade fair, we had all the fruits lined out. And I was I, all morning, I was wandering around thinking, what is that smell? I could, there's, there's, there's something hitting me in the nostrils and I couldn't work out what it was. So I literally went round the stand smelling all the fruits and, and my God, it's guava. That's it. It's sort of, it's more, hmm. It's almost a cross between pineapple and passion fruit, I'd say. It's got something very, very green and almost sweaty smell about it. But then it's it's really, really ripe and just very, very sweet at the same time. It's it was a beautiful smell. And that's now now I know what guava smells like. That's what I smell in this. I know you're laughing like about the sweaty savory, comments, I think, but well. huh? I was gonna say, slightly, maybe it's the sweatiness that you're talking about. There's something slightly savory on the nose as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. almost yeah, salty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Maybe I know, I know people. Pe people are laughing about the um, the passion fruit sweaty thing, but it's it's. I refer to this so often when you're having a aroma wheel, and something that's really really nice sits right next door to something that's not quite so nice. You mean um, like the fact that number two smells a little bit like cat wee? Yes, I did. I did vaguely refer to that. So the two main ones that you get in Sauvignon Blanc, particularly passion fruit and fresh sweat are very, very close to each other. And if anybody's got number two left, if you go back to it, often um, asparagus and catwe are also right next door to each other on an aroma wheel. So, again, it's it's what you're familiar with and, and being a. Um, unfortunately no longer with us but being a cat person well animal person generally but I've had cats for many 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 years I'm very familiar with the the aroma of of asparagus <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm curious oh you can smell pineapple yes very tropical lovely a nice texture as well because we've got more sunshine that equals more sugar, that equals more texture. But there is something else going on here. And this is why I wanted to show you this wine. <gasps> Hi, kitty cat. Sorry, distracted by fur. Apologies. <laughs> oh, hi, gorgeous. She looks like my Tilly. I had a perfectly black one as well. But sorry, distracted by nature and animals very, very easily. Um, what was I going to say? You were talking about... Um, the fact that it's that saving your texture. Brain. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, Louise. Texture. So if you um, okay, if you if you take a sip of water, that that pretty much has no texture. There's just nothing to it. Um, if you drank a glass of skimmed milk, eh, there's a bit of texture. If you drank a glass of full fat milk, that's got a lot more texture. Sometimes we'll refer to it as body or mouth feel is something else that we call it as well but on this one um it's been rested on its leaves so all of these sauvignons they're all exactly the same grape variety but they've each been chosen to show you something different and this one has been rested on its leaves so once the wine it's been fermented in stainless steel should make that clear because that maintains freshness once the yeast has done its job and it's died it's spent which turned the sugar into alcohol 
we don't need it anymore. So all the other wines that we've had this evening, the wine, has, we call it racking off. You rack off the wine. So you, you remove the wine from the lees and then you clean out the stainless steel tank with all the, the, the sludge that the lees has left behind. Lees is what we call yeast once it's died. If you want to add some texture, and a little bit of flavour to the wine, you leave the wine with the fine leaves, so the really, really fine stuff that's dyed. You keep mixing it around every week or so, you give it a bit of a stir, and that just encourages the leaves to integrate more with the wine, and it gives you this wonderful texture. It's the same principle as why um, champagne is richer than Prosecco, for example, because it's been aged on its leaves, and that gives it more texture. You so when you take mentioned... a sip of this one, it just feels a bit bigger in the mouth. It's like it just fills more of the mouth and becomes a bit more full and rounded. You mentioned you mentioned when we were in the Loire, Loire Valley, actually, you mentioned Muscadet, um, which if you carry on down the Loire, you get there. And people might be familiar if they've seen it on the shelves, Muscadet Sur Lee. So S-U-R-L-I-E, Sur Lee. And it's exactly what Pip's talking about there. So that's just the French for on Lees. So if you ever see Sir Lee on the on the label of a bottle of wine, it means it's spent time on its lees, which is going to give it this body. Can you feel it? It's like it just, you, I, I put a bit in my mouth and it's like it just burst into my cheeks. Maybe that's just my cheeks. They're quite mm -hmm. red. <laughs> I'm quite warm. They got squashy cheeks. But yeah, it just it just fills the mouth like the other ones haven't. Do you get it? Do you feel it? Sorry, are you are you answering Louise's point? Is that why you're yes. saying that? Yeah. So it's got, it just feels yes. almost thicker, doesn't it? As a well, wine. It's like Chris has just put, it's almost chewy. Yeah. It's got a real it's, density to it. I think your I think your example earlier is, is perfect. It's the difference between um skimmed milk and double cream. It's that, it's that sort of same idea, isn't it? That that mm that you're getting from it and although you know we're not looking at a wine that is any thicker than any of the others it's just the fact that it is more it feels more textured in your mouth yeah what's the alcohol dam um well so should we go over all of them that we've that we've that we've 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 done since anybody last asked um so the um the, the il casato um was 14 <gasps> percent really? Yes, 14%. Well, that is a surprise. Yes, I was surprised as well when I looked. Um, the, um, the, the Entre de Mer, so the, the, the Bordeaux, is 12%. And if you just bear with me, I will very quickly look at the um, Peter Falker. Um, and this one, I'm going to guess it's going to be um, probably... I'm going to say 14, 13 and a half, I'm voting. <laughs> Yeah, it's because of where we are. We're warmer. We're in South Africa. We're right with flavours. So inevitably, we've got more sugar. Um, and we are 13 and a half. Absolutely. God, I'm good. <laughs> it's always a good guess. And I think um, just to just to sort of because I know people often ask about sort of legs and, and, and on the on a wine. That's not what we're talking about with texture, is it, Pip? You know, it's not. The alcohol not necessarily. doesn't necessarily have any bearing on the texture. Mm, sorry. It's, I was it, looking at it, it can. It can, yeah. It can. Alcohol and sugar can both add texture to a wine. Mm. Sorry. But in this case, it's the fact it's had three months just resting on its lees and being stirred. That's what's added more of the texture. So it's not necessarily going to be more leggy because it's not necessarily more viscous, but how you feel it in the mouth is, is, is bigger, is more rounded. Um, I will just quickly show you where it is. This is Stellenbosch. So actually the, the, um, the grapes for, am I, am I mapping? Um, is it visible? Yes, I've got a nod. Thank you. Um, the grapes for this are sourced within, some are within Stellenbosch, some are also within Franschuk. So Franschuk, where you can see Babylon store, and that is Franschuk up there. It means the French corner, incidentally. But just to show, uh, I think, I was it this one I mentioned about saltiness? 
and actually I've just had it with a little bit of aged pecorino which is really really salty and it, and it stands up to it it's still it's still there it's got more fruit but this is where we are this is false bay in South Africa so called because the um, people that discovered this area they thought it was the end of the world and they thought yay we've made it to the end of the land and then we're oh no there's a bit more so they called it false bay because it's lying it's not but the they're not worried they're going to drop off the earth uh, no, because they, they could still they see the land, so they just kept going. But I think you might be muted, Pip. Am I? Hmm. How did I do so, that then? I don't know. But yeah, this is made by this is made by um, Peter Falker wines um, in South Africa. So Peter Falker um, is a is a German was originally from Germany um, and settled in South Africa. Um, in around about 1960 um, and worked there, not not making wines, but um, but actually acquired the winery where they are now in 1995. Um, and they have a really talented winemaker, uh, Werner Schrenk, who uh, who makes all their wines for them. Um, and it's it's a relatively I don't know if anyone's been on. Well, you probably have been on the tastings. But we've, we've tried a few of their wines over the past few months. Um, we've been really impressed by all of the wines that they do so if you like big reds they do an um, amazing uh cabernet sauvignon they do a wonderful blend with cabernet sauvignon syrah um, which pip showed on the weekend with um what did you show it with goat's cheese charcuterie charcuterie yeah um and this and one, pinot noir pinot noir yeah they do pinot, pinot noir, noir is well. amazing and then this Sauvignon Blanc, and I think this Sauvignon Blanc is just, um, it's got all these, as we've said, these wonderful tropical flavours, which... Um, it's, really I would out. go so far as to say, it's almost, this is the kind of wine that if, if one of my friends said, oh no, I don't like Sauvignon Blanc, I'd give them this anyway, just <laughs> because it's, <laughs> it's almost not what you expect from Sauvignon Blanc, it hasn't got that that racing, bracing acidity. It hasn't got the really almost spiky vegetal nuts. It's so smooth, it's so rounded, it's so mellow and tropical. It doesn't feel like a Sauvignon Blanc that, as, as we know it, if that makes sense. Which is probably quite a nice segue onto the final wine, isn't it? Because when people, think, when people think of Sauvignon Blanc, they think of Marlborough, they think of New Zealand. You know, that's it's almost become a brand in and of itself. Marlborough saving your blonde. That's what people look for. And what was fascinating, I'd be really interested to get people's feedback here, is when we were, we were doing this tasting on the weekend um, at uh, Toby's Garden Festival. So Toby Buckland off the television runs a garden festival, which we did at, um, at, at Powder and Castle this weekend. And we, sh we had 60 wines to show. And these two, five and six, were both there. And so people were trying five and six together. And most people went to try number six first because it was Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, because it was a Sauvignon Blanc that they knew from Marlborough and they would like. But actually, when they tried them both, more people preferred number five than preferred number six. Um, and I'd be really interested to know what people's thoughts are um, from this. You're right, Chris, super, super pale. I'm sorry, can I just pick up on something that you just said there, Dan? Did you yeah. actually just say when we were working with Toby Buckland from the telly? I did. Yes. <laughs> the telly. Do you want to see a picture of me with Toby? No. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody else is, is, a, is a keen gardener and watches Gardener's World, um, I did have a starstruck moment with Joe Swift um, on yes. the weekend. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Joe yeah. sort of walked into the room just like, hi, Joe! <laughs> like he knew him. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know you from the telly. That's embarrassing. Oh, yeah. yeah no, I don't actually know you. <laughs> Awkward. Um, so I'm going to start with a map on this one. I know you're all thrilled by this. Uh, let me just get to the right country. Gosh, I know I keep saying this, everyone, but my goodness, isn't this different? I mean, just putting it's your name different. In And I said it with Gosh, everyone. That it's, it's like what, it's like we've chosen the wines on purpose to actually be different <laughs> but who knew yeah, as, as if somehow we wanted to show how different saving your blog from <laughs> one place to another <laughs> well done Pip. well well chosen um thank you thank you <laughs> uh, oh gosh can i just say before i show you the map this when i stuck my nose in this one first time 
first thing I thought of was embers. It's, it's like something burning in the background. Now I'm sticking my nose in and it's it's one of my favourite words in the English language and what it represents is also one of my favourite things I'm in, just in the world. It's my the rain just smell. Has it? Oh my god, go outside and you'll smell it. I'm going to put it in the chat because in capitals because I love it so much. Oh, except I'm not connected to the chat. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, the dog's being a pain, so I'm coming in and out. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so you, whilst Pip's doing that, you mentioned Pip Embers, and actually the thing, when I put my nose in, it, I know it hasn't been, you know, I know this is made in stainless steel, but my first instinct when I stuck my nose in was, has this had a little bit of oak? Because yeah. you get those, those sort of slightly burnt, slightly toasty notes coming off it. Which it's, is now I'm going back to it, it's almost like it's super, super mineral. It's, yeah. it's gone beyond, if you think of wood becomes charcoal, it's it's gone beyond being woody and it's now mineral. Yeah. That's what it is. And it's called petrichor, for those that can see the chat, petrichor. It's the smell of rain on a hot day and that wonderful, earthy, grassy, vegetal smell that comes off the soil. It's absolutely wonderful. Wet earth. I love it. And it's very characteristic in New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. You get this gorgeous, a bit on perhaps I'd like, very cold. Yeah, I agree. I think I would probably like it colder. But you get this wonderful, huge fruit, but then something very, very, very mineral about it as well. So let me just show you the map quickly. Here we are. We're in New Zealand. Agree, New Zealand? Excellent. I got. Oh, let me get. Oopsie. Wow, the acidity on this is is amazing. Actually, I haven't tried. And it I yet. think like, for me, like I'm, it's sort of on the sort of gooseberry sort of scale, if you like this. Whereas I don't think you got. I think I don't think I got that with any of the others, where you're getting that that sharp green fruit. It's the I first time I think, the first one on where I've tasted that real zingy you know we've had acidity but this is really you know it gets you right right here right up underneath the ears it's a smiley wine it makes it makes you smile because of the acidity so um new zealand two islands we are going to zoom in to the northernmost point of the south island so blenheim is the main town if you fly to um marlborough this is where you will fly to blenheim and the main river, so this, the top, the very, very green part at the top, this is the Richmond Range. And if anybody's seen a bottle of Cloudy Bear, and it's got gorgeous sort of misty, mysterious um, mountains on its label, that is a picture of the Richmond Range, ads taken by the then winemaker, Kevin Judd, because he was a keen photographer as well. But you've got this bit here, the Wairu Valley, which is where a lot of the wines come from. So you see it flows all the way down. It's such an amazing valley. It's like a perfect example as a, as a geography geek. It's a perfect example of a valley. And then it opens up into the flatlands and that's where you get Rennick and um, Waipara and Blenheim and all the other places that you might have recognised from a label. And look at all the beautiful vineyards. Oh, they're just gorgeous. So that is certainly when I joined the wine industry 20 years ago, that is where all Marlborough, New Zealand came from. And then probably not that long ago, probably 12, 13 years ago, we started hearing about this place called the Awatery, which you have to say with a question mark. If we go over... The, the Can I just say Louise is familiar with Awatery? Did did you find yes. it in your did you find it inside the box, Louise? We got the hour tree. Yeah. So um I don't know if it makes it clear from this map, but the Richmond range here is very, very, very green because this is where the rain falls. And then this range here is called the Wither Hills, W-I-T-H-E-R. And they're called the Wither Hills because they're completely barren. There's not a lot grows there and it's because they don't get much rainfall. So then if you go even further south of that to the other side 
of the Wither Hills, you can see the river following through down, following the valley, flowing down into the sea. And this is the Arwatiri River. So therefore, this valley that it forms is the Arwatiri Valley. And uh, this is Lake Grasmere, by the way, just as a, <laughs> a note, nothing to do with the Lake District. But again, as you start getting down into the flatter parts of the valley, this is where all the vineyards are. So you can see, even in New Zealand, if we showed you a wine that was from um, Rapaura up here, right next to the Richmond Range, it would be much more lime and passion fruit and really vibrant, zesty, tropical flavours because it's so got so much water from the Richmond Range. Whereas where we're going now is right down into the very arid part of Marlborough, into the Arwatery. And it's much, much more savoury, much more vegetal. So what we think we know is Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, this really big, just huge fruit bomb of passion fruit and mango. This is going to be, well, you tell us, more, more grassy, more green, more pea pod. Mm. And this one, this one works with the asparagus again. Back, back to the asparagus. Oh, I like that. Burnt lemon. It is. Yeah. Barbecue at the weekend. I'm going to whack a lemon on and see what it smells like. <laughs> it's the only way we learn what things smell like. Experience. And I think what another thing that's sort of worth saying just about New Zealand. So we, we all think of New Zealand saving your bronc as a brand. You know, Marlborough saving your Um, It's what we all yeah. sort of go and look for. Um, New Zealand is... Other than probably England, which is up and coming, it's a wine region that has happened entirely in our lifetimes. You know, <laughs> wine only arrived in New Zealand um, in the well, vineyard. Sorry, vines only arrived in New Zealand around about the seventies. And that mid seventies, yeah, the whole of the New Zealand wine industry, you know, is less than sort of fifty years old. Um, but yeah, it's become, you know, it's, it's one of those places where most people would recognise the name Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. And most people that recognise it would probably be able to accurately describe what the Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc tastes like. Albeit as Pip's highlighting, maybe maybe it's not quite what we think. It's, but, it's a lot more broader than we yeah. think it is. And um Sometimes, so three things. I want to talk about green pepper. I want very briefly, I know we're at time. Green pepper, um, 2021 vintage. Write these down, Dan, so I don't forget. And oh, there's something else which I've just forgotten. Can't remember. It'll come back to me. But on, sometimes man. with New Zealand Sauvignon, you get this really, really intense green pepper quality. Um, which a few years ago was seen as a positive, but then more recently, it has actually become a negative. We, we, it's, it's called capsaicin. It's the same thing you get in chilies. It's and, and, and yeah, in green peppers. If you slice green pepper and, and then squeeze it in your hand and smell your hand, that is the smell of capsaicin. And it got to a point where is the, oh, um, growth volume. That was the other thing. Um, or, um, yield volume that was the other yeah. thing I wanted to tell you about um it's got now to the point where there is so much more um diversity in the style and the flavor and the texture and the smells that you're getting out of New Zealand Sauvignon if you get one that you smell it and it says oh wow that's just green pepper it's it's actually a sign of bad winemaking because it shows that they haven't had enough sunshine or they haven't treated the grapes properly in the vineyard to actually get enough fruit quality and complexity and layers in the wine so they just purely rely on this green pepper compound to to make it taste like New Zealand Sauvignon but I had one last year I judge in the international wine challenge and I had one oh huh? oh um, I had one last year in the International Wine Challenge and people are like, oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. And I put it through as an out. No, this is faulty. This is not good winemaking. And I had to stand there in front of masters of wine and people like Jamie Good and Tim Atkin, who are absolute legends in the wine industry and explain to them 
this, in my opinion, is not a good wine because they're purely relying on green pepper and nothing else. There's nothing else there. And I won. By the way, I was right, but that was beside the point. Um, the other two things, yay, thank you. <laughs> it's being confident in your conviction sometimes. The other things that I wanted to mention, so we have seen so much New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc in recent years, in the last couple of decades. In terms of wine production, so not um, what we see in the UK market or export, but in terms of actual volume of wine that is produced in these countries, Italy is first, France is second. Um, is it Australia or Spain third? I think Spain, Spain is third, Spain. then it's Argentina, and then it's people like, um, yeah, South Africa and Australia. Where, what number would you guess New Zealand to be? in terms of how much wine or how much juice they make for wine. So where it comes, yeah, whether whether it's obviously not first, because we said that's Italy. So is it is it 10th, is it 20th, is it 30th in the world in terms of its actual volume of production? Consider how much we see in this country of New Zealand. Hey, Louise, says, Louise says 10. We've got a, a vote 12. for 12, we've got a vote for four and five as well. So we think quite high up. If I tell you that China, is around eight or ninth in terms of how much grape juice they produce. New Zealand is about 27th because they've done really, really well at one particular kind of wine. Yes, there's lots of other wines from New Zealand, but New Zealand Sauvignon is the one that they've really hit the UK market with. But if you go to other countries, you don't see it as much. If you go to pretty much anywhere in Europe, you will not see New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc because they have their own wine there. It's pretty much the UK, um, German has actually taken it on very well, Belgian, um, Chinese and American markets that Kingdom. have taken on New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and Scandinavia. But in terms of- Nil point. Nil point. In terms of actual volume, it's, it's really quite low to what we see. But also the other thing I just wanted to mention very, very briefly, don't know if you were aware, but in 2021, New Zealand had a really shocking harvest. Their harvest was about 19% lower than it was expected to be. And it was because of everything that can go wrong in a vineyard, frankly. They had frost at the wrong time, both at fruit set and at harvest. So that destroyed a lot of the vineyards. Um, we had, um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 2020. Yes, beg your pardon, the year before. Um, they had floods in certain areas. They had lots of hailstorms in certain areas. It was just everything went wrong, frankly. And I don't know if you noticed, but in supermarkets particularly, you didn't get so much of the um, half price deals on New Zealand Sauvignon. And what was available was generally a lot more expensive. But just to put it into context, their harvest was down 19%. Does anybody want to have a guess how much wine that is in bottles? I think the other thing to point out on that, if you, I mean, it's, it's, we're on to 2022 now, but what you probably would have found if you'd have looked closely is that a lot of Sauvignon Blanc that was coming out into the supermarkets in 22 was actually labelled as New Zealand Sauvignon, not, not Marlborough. Marlborough Sauvignon, because they were having to get grapes from a wider area to make it. So a 19% drop in production You're muted again for me if I don't know about you. I'm not I'm not muted everyone else can hear me just just your selective hearing Still clearly muted, I think Every, can it can everyone else hear me is it just me yeah it's just <laughs> you <laughs> oh well that's not a bad guess actually Simon and Nikki 12 million so 19 percent reduction in production of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, Marlborough specifically Sauvignon Blanc, equated to 85 million bottles of wine. Ah! And that is mostly into the UK. So that's why there was such a shortage. And um, from a, a buying point of view, we, we just couldn't get it for love and the money. And what you could get was the really expensive stuff because people were keeping the grapes for their own labels and not sending it out to the more mass produced market. I think just because to put that in context as well, Pip, for those that, you know, 85 million sounds like a big number. If you think that the production of champagne, say one region in France is around about 300 million bottles. 
yeah, that that's sort three. of puts into context, you know, yeah. the, the, the scale of the New Zealand um Sauvignon, well, the New Zealand wine industry. Yeah. Champagne's about yeah, about th about 350 million or 320 million just yeah. in Champagne. Just just Champagne. So that's just one champagne. small region in France. It's teeny tiny, really. Yeah. Shall we... But sorry, I feel like I've waffled slightly, but it's because I'm slightly impassioned about New Zealand and sword and blood and wine in general. <laughs> but from those six wines, when when we first said before, we're going to do a before, tasting, I was going to say before we do a vote on the six, because I, I just I asked the question before we tried that last one. Could we do a vote on five and six and just see which is the preference on those? Oh, two, okay. And then do a and then do a wider everything vote. So who would vote for five? Who would vote for six? I think that's, it's almost half and half to be fair. From what I can see. Yeah. I've got lots of shows of hands, but I know when we, when we said we're going to do a Sauvignon Blanc tasting for Sauvignon, International Sauvignon Blanc Day, and I thought, oh gosh, can we do that? Is there enough? Is it, is it going to be different enough? And I know I said at the top that it's it's subtle. There's there's small differences, but actually through tasting all six of these, some of those differences have been quite notable, mm. I think. So I'm hoping it's it's shown. Yes, it's it's one great variety, but depending on where it's grown and the climate and the altitude and the soil and how it's treated in the winery. There's actually a lot of difference in there. So people saying, oh, I don't like Sauvignon Blanc. Hmm, well, have you tried the Peter Falker from South Africa? Because that's not like a Sauvignon Blanc. It's a lot more diverse than we think. So as we always do at the end of these sessions, can we just have in the chat box or show of fingers, whichever you prefer, um, what, which have your, been your favourite wines? And again, remember, you can have as many favourites as you like because they can be favourites for different reasons. This is hard tonight, Pip. It is so hard. I've, I haven't got a standout favourite tonight. Oh, um, thank you, Rob. That's very it's, kind words indeed. And it's, yeah, I think, gosh, because um, normally I go for, I know you always choose like all six of them because you cheat and you just go, yeah, you can have as many favourites as you want. I'm going to choose them all. Um, and I, I generally go with one. Um, I'm struggling tonight to pick one that I would say was my absolute favourite. I think mm. two definitely um, is is excellent. I really love number two, um, but I also love the Peter Falker number five. Um, so it's it's got to be one of those two for me. Go on, what are you going for? Are you going for all six? Me, see, okay, okay. I'm, I'm literally going to go through the list and justify it. <laughs> if I was having friends around for drinky poos on a hot day, it would be number one. Yes. If um, it's me cooking something with wild garlic for myself, then number two. Just if... for yourself. No one else is allowed to share that one with you. No, nope, just me. Okay. <laughs> you might, might, might find a theme here. Um, I thought the cassata was really interesting. I love that that and the Entre de Mer both had a bit of age to it. So I thought they showed really nicely. And I personally did like the semillon in there I think that showed really really well the PF I just think is so wonderfully textured the snapper rock I like but it's not my favorite I find for me that one's just the, the minerality comes through a bit too much but that's my personal taste so if I had to choose one favorite either four or five or two <laughs> just just to summarize we have had votes for number one and number two and number three and number four and number five and number six and number seven which is interesting <laughs> um, i think I, I, I think five on certainly on what was put in the chat i think five probably had the most yeah i think just on on um so just on number six quickly because we hadn't done that one and uh, I know um, th there's always the question so the ABV on number six is 28 um, percent so, so relatively low in compared to some, some of the others and I think the other thing to say on uh, number six is just in terms of the value again you know more more Brussonian is going up and up and up all the time and for um, and so I think it's you know I think there used to be a time in the supermarkets when you could find Marlborough um, under a tenner in the supermarkets I think that's happening less and less now 
And when you do find it, it tends to be bulk shipped. So it's shipped over here in plastic containers and then bottled um, in this country. Um, whereas what we've got here, I think the Snapper Rock, whilst it's not my favourite, I think is a really good example of Marlborough um, and the price point at 1260 for a mix six, um, which is an estate bottle of wine, um, I think is a really, it's a really good yes. example of Marlborough Sauvignon Young Blanc. Yes, bottled at source is key. Yeah. Okay. That's really pleasing that everything has got a vert tonight. I'm really pleased with that. And all very different from one little grape variety. Have you enjoyed it? With, with a dash of semi on in there. I mean, we, we, a we dash of semi on. Yeah. <laughs> dash of semi on. <laughs>